Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to the first part in our 2022 Caring Culture Series, Generation to Generation. My name is Sarah Fang, and I am the manager and programmer at the Doris Duke Theater here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. I want to give a big thank you to our presenting partners for this series, the Pacific Islands Development Program at the East West Center. Please be on the lookout for the second and third part in this series, which we hope to have in the fall in person on this Doris Duke Theater stage. Um, for now, I want to pass it on to our partners at PIDP uh, to Dr. Mary Hattori. Thank you so much, Sarah. Aloha, half a day. Greetings. My name is Mary Therese Perez Hattori, and I'm interim director of the East West Center's Pacific Islands Development Program. We are honored to be one of the partners organizing and offering this webinar. I'm a native tomorrow of the island of Guam and today convey warm greetings and aloha from the East West Center on the island of Oahu, from the Ahu Kua'a of Waikiki in the Ili of, of Puhia and acknowledge with gratitude and respect the ancestral lands of the Kanaka Maoli, the indigenous people of Hawaii. The late great Chuki scholar and civil rights advocate, Dr. Joachim Jojo Peter, wrote of the computer as a canoe, our virtual canoe which carries life and connects us across the waves of cyberspace. Today we use this virtual canoe to carry our voices, our spirit, our poetry. I'm honored to welcome our moderator, my friend and colleague, Lauren Keenan. Lauren is Deputy Consul General at the New Zealand Consulate General in Hawaii. She took up that position in February, 2020. She joined the Foreign Service in early 2015. And prior to her posting in Hawaii, she worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Wellington, New Zealand. Prior to joining Foreign Service, Lauren worked for eight years on a Maori policy and indigenous issues at both the Ministry of Maori Development and the Ministry of Justice. She is also a writer seeking to bring diverse indigenous stories to a range of audiences. She has had two books published, Amarangi and Millie's Trip Through Time, published in 2022, and the 52-week project, How I Fixed My Life by Trying a New Thing for a Week for 52 Weeks, published in 2020. She has also published a number of short stories. And in 2017, she won the prestigious Pikihuia Award for Maori Writers, and in 2019 was shortlisted in the Best Emerging Writer category of the same awards. Mahalo Nui, Sidus Maasi Lauren, for being our moderator today. Pass the mic to you. Just to open in Te Reo Maori, uh, kia ora koutou, e hui hui mai nei. Just to introduce myself briefly, Ko Taranaki Maunga, Ko Waiwakaio Awa, No Natitiwiti o Tiatiawa O, Ko Lauren Keenan Taku Ingwa. It is an absolute delight to be here amongst colleagues and friends and some incredibly inspirational poets to talk about what we call in, what we use the phrase kopapa in Māori or subject, such an important thing for us to look into, carrying cultures from generation to generation. First of all, I'm incredibly in awe of poets. While I love to write, poetry is not my forte. I, I never find there's enough words there, they're a, little, a little sparse um, for my talents, unfortunately. That's why I'm incredibly humbled and delighted to partake in your poetry. And secondly, I just wanted to say a few words about the subject matter at hand, you know, generation to generation carrying culture. And in, in Māori tikanga and mataranga Māori, we talk about our ancestors sit on our shoulders to guide us. That is a theme that I try very hard to capture in my writing, especially my writing for children. I also wanted to share a whakatoki or proverb in Te Reo Māori that's one of my personal favourites and is relevant here today. One bit, it, it goes, Kei te kōhatahi, te kākaho, ka whati, kei te kapuia, e kore, e whati. To translate that briefly, if a reed stands alone, it can be broken. If it is in a group, it cannot. And let us now be these reeds standing together. 
showcasing diverse vo voices into the world and to go from generation to generation and carry our very important cultures. Thank you very much. Just to move on from talking about myself there briefly and also expressing my immense gratitude to be here today. I wanted to first put the spotlight on our first poet here today, Dr. Dr. Conay Thaman, uh, whom I just had the pleasure of meeting. Now, Dr. Thaman is one of the longest serving staff of the University of South Pacific before she retired. And she holds a personal chair from the USP in Pacific Education and Culture, as well as being the UNESCO Chair in Teacher Education and Culture all the many years between 1998 and 2016. She was born and raised in the Kingdom of Tonga, where she received her primary and secondary education. She then studied at the University of Auckland, the University of California in Santa Barbara, and the University of the South Pacific. She's taught in high schools in Tonga before moving to Santa Barbara and later in 1974 to Suva in Fiji. During this time, she's had an immense track record of researching and publishing widely in the areas of curriculum, teacher education, indigenous education, women and university management, and more recently, something very interesting and personal interest to me, Pacific Research Frameworks and Education for Sustainable Development. She has held a number of senior management positions at the USP, including the Director for the Institute of Education, the Head of the School of Humanities, and the Pro Vice Chancellor. She's also held a number of roles in UNESCO. In 2020, she was a small group of Pacific educators who founded the Rethinking Pacific Education Initiative, which has continued to be an important force in educational development in the Pacific Island region. Most importantly, and the reason that she's here today, as well as, as if that very, very long and uh, impressive resume wasn't enough, is that she is a poet whose work is studied by school children throughout the Pacific and beyond. <laughs> Many of her poems have been translated into several languages, including Chinese, French, and German. Collections of her, five, sorry, five collections of her poetry have been published. You, the choice of my parents in 1974, Langakali in 1981, Hingango in 1987, Kakala in 1993, and Songs of Love in 1999. I'll now, I'll now turn to her to read a poem from her collection. So, um, okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to read one poem, and um, it is probably the one that um, that I'm most uh, known for, and it is one of the favorites of um, young people um, in the schools in the Pacific. And I I started uh, writing poetry out of desperation when I was a school teacher in Tonga, because I hated English. I couldn't speak it in a school where English was the medium of instruction and uh, we were punished for speaking Tongan. So when I went back to Tonga to teach, lo and behold, the principal told me to go and teach Form 5 English, which is like grade um, 11 in the same high school. And so all of a sudden I was faced with teaching the very things I hated when I was a student there. And so I started to try to write some poems which were about Tonga, which my students, the Tongan students, would be able to relate to. And um, I took a course at, at the University of the South Pacific. Um, it's a Tonga Center, one of the first to be set up by the regional university. And that I learned quite a lot about um, rhyming and uh, symbols and um, all the things that I was supposed to teach, which I didn't really understand. So this was one of the, of the ones, <clears throat> this is the title of my first collection, which a lot of students have been uh, subjected to throughout the region, but they love it uh, because it is something that they could relate to and which is the, the whole purpose of my turning to poetry is to pass on the knowledge that I had or that I 
uh, as a Tongan, as a Pacific Islander, to share it with the students, uh, Pacific students, because of these um, years and years of learning English, of learning poetry that made no sense to us. Um, so I'll just read you the choice of my parents, for which I got into trouble with many of, uh, of my elders when I was younger and when I wrote this way, way back. Um, because it, it was, it's about arranged marriages. And this is very common in the Pacific. And uh, it may not be done um, purposefully, but it is done in all kinds of very subtle ways. Whether you're a noble or whether you're a commoner, um, it happens. So I will read that because um, I kind of like it myself, although I got into trouble in writing it. Now I'm older, I don't really, I don't really mind. This is um, you the choice of my parents. Um, you come clad in your fine mats and tupper cloth, the brown skin bursting with fresh perfumed oil, your eyes shining like stars in a clear night. You the choice of my parents. You will bring them wealth and fame with your Western type of education and secondhand car, but you do not know me, my prince, save that I am first born and have known no other man. I fit your plans and schemes for the future, but you cannot see the real me. My face is masked with pretense and obedience, and my smiles tell you that I care. I have no other choice. The priest has left the altar now, and the dancing has begun. I see myself dying slowly to family and traditions, stripped of its will and carefree spirit, naked, on the cold and lonely waters of a strange family shoreline, alienated from belonging truly. I love as a mere act of duty. My soul is far away, clinging to that familiar ironwood tree that heralds strangers to the land of my ancestors. I will bear you a son to prolong your family tree and fill the gaps in your genealogy. And when my duties are fulfilled, my spirit will return to the land of my birth where you will find me no more, except for the weeping willows along the shore. Wow. That, that's did you beautiful. get that? <laughs> I did. It's absolutely beautiful. I, I think <laughs> that, that last, the last two lines, Oh. I'm still I'm still thinking on them. They're incredibly okay. powerful. Thank you very much for sharing that. Oh, I'm glad it came through. <laughs> As I said, I got into trouble with that one. <laughs> that actually leads me to one of the questions I did want to ask is, you know, as artists, we have words and words have power. Right. But once the <laughs> but once the words go into the world we lose control over the power that the words can wield. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that and the impact that has had on your writing and your life. Yeah, well, it, it is true because once you, once you write things down and it gets published, it, it belongs to the reader, I think, because they make meaning out of what you write. And whether it's the correct meaning, whether you intended it to be like that, it's really out of your hand, so to speak. Um, and so because I am Tongan, and Tonga is a very small place, and because I, um, particularly when I moved to the University of the South Pacific here in Fiji, um, and working in Tonga, because Tonga uh, was and is still part of the university, 12 island nations own the University of the South Pacific. So every time I went to Tonga, I would get all these, you know, bad looks and bad uh, comments and, you know, what I, I was such and such. But my, my biggest fans were the school kids because they loved the poems and the teachers were prescribing them because they were so relevant um, for Tonga and Tongans. Um, as I said, that was one of my, um, my original purpose for actually writing, it was mainly 
for Tongan students so that they could to contextualize what they were learning at school. So, but things changed as I got older and, um, and I think uh, in a place like Tonga and in many Pacific Islands, people look up to you because you're old. <laughs> so now I don't have to worry about um, what people say. But you know, when I first started, and this was one of my first published poems, um, it was a bit difficult to take uh, the reaction because the whole poem is about arranged marriages. And um, as I said, a lot of parents, uh, whether they, they do it um, intentionally or they think you know, about uh, who their, their kids are going to marry, um, it, affects, it affects the children because in the end, um, if you're a good, a good child, you do what your parents uh, tell you to do. And that could be disastrous, especially for girls, as you know. Um, but with, uh, with the women's movement now, it's, uh, it is easier. But still, there are some young girls uh, who go through um, difficulties trying to do the things that they like rather than what their family and their parents uh, want them to do. I just had one more question. You know, from what you've said, it sounds like you're incredibly brave. Would you consider yourself to be used in your words as a form of bravery? Uh, a form of what? Bravery. Oh, bravery. Um, I didn't really feel brave. And, and one of the, I think one of the things I had, which I later realized that, um, that was good for my writing was really not living in Tonga. Um, because I have lived here in Fiji since 1974. I would go back and forth, I go to Tonga. And there aren't that many Tongan women who write and publish. They probably write a lot of poetry, but they, they are not published. And part of that, I think, is because if you're living in Tonga or living in a community and you write critical things about your own community, it's, you really have to be very, very brave. But um, because I, live, I lived here, I continue to live here in Fiji, I'm able to, um, to write these things. And so I guess you might say, I, I just write and then run away, I guess. Um, but I, you know, I used to defend the things that I write about, um, but, it's not easy in a very small community, particularly to, to write the kinds of things that I used to write and I continue to write. But to me, it's very, very important. This is one of the, the ways of getting children and students to think critically is to write things that they can relate to and encourage them to think critically about their culture, about their communities, because I reckon that when you do that, you strengthen um, your culture, you strengthen the knowledge base of your community. And, um, and to me, that's, I saw that as my, my job as a teacher um, and as a writer. You know, that's really interesting. In, in Māori literature communities, we talk a lot about how hard it is to be critical of your own culture and your work lest it play into the hands of racists, basically, who are looking for excuses to be critical about our cultures. Uh, and it's a very hard, it's a hard tightrope to walk at times. I'd be interested in your <laughs> views on that. I think. Yeah. It is. It is very hard. Um, but to me, that's what education is about and um, and I think the whole discourse that you shouldn't criticize uh, your culture um, makes it a dead a dead culture uh, you know to me a living change is a is a part of living and if you don't change then you know to me you just continue doing the same old thing all the time there's really no improvement and it is not easy, as you say, and, um, and to me, it's very important to teach young children to think critically and 
about everything and not just to, con to criticize what is happening, but to come up with some, um, you know, a better way of doing things. And so um, to me, it is just very, very important. Unfortunately, our education systems around the Pacific has is, is actually failed to uh, push this particular aspect of learning. And the reason is because our curriculum is dominated by imported uh, knowledge, imported values. <clears throat> and so what we do is, um, used to do as young people in schools is to memorize, memorize all those things so we could pass the exam without really understanding what we were learning. Um, and so I saw that as one of my major um, tasks as an educator here at the university to try and make the curriculum, the school curriculum, contextualize it and make it culturally democratic in the sense that we should learn about our own, our own selves, our own um, uh, society and culture. And then I realized that, you know, poetry was, is, was not an English thing. Uh, they didn't invent poetry. Poetry was around us, is around us. And that's what I did when I was teaching school. I got the kids to bring their favorite songs and analyze Tongan songs and look at them and look at rhyming and look at the features of poetry that was in the curriculum, but the poems were in English. I mean, um, I told them the English didn't invent poetry, poetry, we have poetry. And so that's what my, um, my aim was. And also I was a, a, a female, I was a woman and most of the poems I studied in school and they, I was teaching were all about, all written by men. So I wanted to actually, I, I suppose show my students that uh, you can be a, a famous woman, a famous poet in terms of who is reading your work. Um, and of course now we don't have to ask that question anymore, but it still happens um, in the sense that what we do now is, um, you know, we say we are, in a, we are feminists, we're doing this, we're doing that, but we've got to show our people and our students that women, um, they can be poets, they can be published poets. And um, so that was my, I suppose, when I was younger, um, an aim that I didn't think I, I would achieve, but coming here to Fiji and back to your question, it was much easier for me to write here in Fiji, away from Tonga. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I found that reading from Dr. Thurman just then incredibly insightful and, and there's a lot that she said that will give me pause for thought and something to think about. Uh, but now I'm absolutely delighted to move on to our next uh, poet, Alyssa Chow. Alyssa is Chima Chimaro and Taiwanese. She serves as a consultant with the Pacific Islands Development Program on cataloging and organizing their publications and reports. She also works at Best Press, supporting customers with special orders and book recommendations, which to me sounds like hashtag dream job. She has previously worked as an online teacher and a private English tutor in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, she's traveled to various countries as a freelance voice artist, which intrigues me. And she's also voiced a number of projects with independent companies and has been involved in the cartoon animation, virtual reality, video games, and music CDs. She was pursuing a Bachelor of Education focusing on elementary education. However, after working with the Pacific Islands Development Program, she is now planning on pursuing a Bachelor of Arts in Sustainability from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2026. And I would be absolutely delighted to hear from Alyssa a poem. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, just touch on what you said about Dream Job. You are correct. I do work at a, I work at a wonderful little indie bookstore um, and I work, work at PIDP as well. And 
I got to say, I'm, I'm living the life. So I'm very grateful to be here. Um, again, just want to reiterate, I'm so honored to be here, to be part of this space with other poets, female poets. Um, I would just like to thank Dr. Thaman for that wonderful sharing. I think it resonates with all of us here and, and it's very touching. Yeah. Um, I'll be reading one poem today and this poem is for my mother and for all that she's given. And so it's sort of about, you know, growing up in Taiwan, I was a third culture kid. I didn't have any connection to my culture on, I wanna say both ends, Taiwanese and Chamorro. Grew up in a very strange subspace of culture that, you know, didn't grow up like a Taiwanese family or like a Chamorro family. Um, so, you know, it was this strange place to navigate. And I think as I've grown a little bit, I say a little bit older because I'm still growing into myself, but as I've, as I've experienced more and kind of, you know, seen what my culture has to, has to give and what it means, um, I've come to, to appreciate it and to realize that it's valuable. So this is for my mom and for how she gave that to me and how she, she sort of revived that part of me that I didn't know was there. Yeah. This poem is called, I am here because. I am here because voices from a faraway land tell me I am to be with them. My mother tells me she hears the same thing. A chorus of harmonies is ringing in our ears. A metronome pounds in our blood. I hear that chorus in my mother's voice when she speaks to me in Chamorro, when she calls me Nenny, when she teaches me the word enough which means to make good for one another. When she sings Johnny Swan to me in the kitchen, and when we sit on a little couch that is comfort itself, and all I can hear is what she speaks. I am here because voices from a faraway land tell me I am to return to the land where my mother was barefoot and bright eyed, with the juice of fruit forever staining her chin, where she slept on her father's chest in afternoon sun, small hands grasping at branches an existence intertwined with the dirt beneath her feet and every living thing in the trees. I am here because my mother lived and breathed to love in a language her children did not speak in a home that would not recognize it, a house, not a home. Unsettling silence is ringing in her ears, in our ears, quiet children, an even quieter mother. Attempting to survive a father that booms and shouts with a voice never soothing. I am here because my mother makes our house a home. Once the booming and shouting has left, she weaves harmony into our walls and roof like a basket, fills it with sun and sweetness. We sing Johnny Saban and learn enough Amalek. When we listen closely, a different sound echoes. But when I leave home and I flee the things I've outgrown, I worry what will ring in my ears. But my mother tells me the chorus of voices will follow us wherever we go. The metronome will pound and pound and pound until it's just the sound of your very heartbeat. It will not be unrecognizable as it is now. It will be etched in my being stitched into my subconscious, living in every breath I breathe, as simple as the air that surrounds me. I am here because my mother tells me the chorus of voices is not from a faraway land, but within me. She hears it when I speak. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. That's really, really cool. I think, I think the thing that I loved about your poem specifically is the phrase chorus of voices. Because what you've done for me as another Indigenous woman is articulated 
this idea that we all feel, but I've never actually heard it called that before. So in giving something a name that had no name, that, that's a real gift. And I thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd be interested as well in your influences. Obviously your mum has been a big influence, but what else has influenced your art, do you think? You know, I, I think it's, you know, as you said, it's, it's, it's my mom, but it's so many things that I can't articulate. I think, you know, I'm grateful to have grown up in Taiwan. I'm grateful for the experiences, the diverse experiences I had growing up in a very mixed community. And I think the blessings from that and as well, the trauma that came with that has influenced a lot of my work. Um, and I think, you know, if you, if you if listen to that poem, there's a lot of musical influences as well. My, my mother has been doing voiceover work for just over 18 years, actually. So that's how I got into being a voice artist. And she sings and she's so talented. And, and my siblings are very talented as well. And so I think, you know, that, that pounding in, in our in the very depths of our souls and that, that harmony, the chorus of voices, it's so much. It's, it's our being, it's our gut, it's our ancestors, it's our culture calling to us. And I think, again, growing up, I, I grew up and identity was just such a difficult, painful, confusing thing. So I think, you know, again, when I grew into myself, I was trying to unearth that. And I think I realized at some point that pounding and that, that ringing in, our, in my ears, in my mother's ears, it's always been there. It's not new, you know? My Chamorro side is, it's not invented just now. It's always been there, but it's just unearthing it and getting it out that's been, you know, the difficult part and the, the rewarding part. Um, so yeah, I think my influences are, of course, my mother, and of course, that that pounding inside that resonates and that is constant, and with it, the joy that comes, and yeah, and the fulfilling part of it. Thank you. I answered your question. <laughs> Not no, sure no, was, that was yeah, that was that was beautiful, and uh, I did, I did have one more question actually. If, if I may, uh, you mentioned trauma and you mentioned the difficulty of identity, which I think is, is much more of a consistent theme than we give it credit for. And I wonder what poetry is for you as a healer. That is a very good question. Um, so, you know, I, I was just thinking about, I was writing about this last night, actually, because um, one of my New Year's resolutions was to write one piece a week, which is very, very daring. So far, I've been consistent. I don't know how long that's going to work out, but I was looking through my old poems and I was just kind of reflecting and writing like a, an update on how I feel. And I came across something where I said in my notes, I said, you know, for so long, you know, I've, I've, taken all of this trauma about identity and about being a young woman and being sexualized as a young woman and being sexualized as a foreigner or a, a foreigner in, a, in an Asian country. And I think for a lot of it, it was, you know, sort of just burying it very deep inside. And I think that my poetry, the example that I used was it's like fossils taking these fossils that have been preserved and that have been sitting stagnant for a very long time and just carefully, carefully brushing away the dust and, and understanding how delicate it is and how important it is and how these are you know, relics of the past. And how do I take this relic of the past and how do I turn it into something that is good and that's true? Um, and that's true to me and true to my culture and, and that represents who I am. 
So I think for me, that's what my poetry is. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. <laughs> so I think next up, uh, we have no Ravella, who is a OEV poet, performer, and educator. Her debut book of poetry, Ask the Brindled, won the 2021 National Poetry Series series and is available for pre-order from Milkweed Editions. Her work has been featured in Poetry, Lit Hub, ANMLY, Beloit, Doris Duke Theatre and the Library of Congress. She has performed throughout Hawaii as well as Canada, Papua New Guinea and at the United Nations. She's currently an Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Hawaii in Moana, sorry, at Manoa. I would love very dearly now to hand over to her for one of her own poems. Mahalo, Lauren, for facilitating such beautiful conversations uh, between us. It's such a privilege and pleasure to be here. Mahalo for the invitation to share story with everyone. Um, it is such a great, humbling thing to be in this event alongside Dr. Konai Helu Thamen, whose work has been instrumental for so many wahine here in Oceania. So mahalo nui loa, mahalo Alyssa for sharing that aloha that you have, especially guided by your mother. Um, it was very beautiful to hear. And to continue with story today, I will be reading a poem called, When You Say Protesters Instead of Protectors. I wrote the poem in 2019 to speak back to the way mainstream media was depicting Kia'i who stood to protect Mauna Kea from desecration. It is dedicated to the Kia'i both on and off the front lines to the Aipohaku Wahine who protect their lands and waters, to all the Poealohe Aina who follow indigenous ceremonies of protection and love. When you say protesters instead of protectors, I would call it a trick if it wasn't so terrifying how your lips do not move when you speak. Your smile, shiny as a church, but who could ever trust a prayer without evidence of a free tongue? On the rare occasion, sound shakes loose, words, no matter how unmuzzled, words still go to die. In your mouth, even Womb is womb. And sometimes I dream of tearing your throat wide open and finding there where stories should be born. Only bleeding, bleeding and the wish to desecrate. We are yet again portrayed by you as the girl, the native, the water, the mountain that was asking for it. Your lips, so Sunday still. And sometimes, sometimes I believe you. So it's best I keep hiding knives in my hair the way my grandmother, not God, the way my grandmother intended. Mahalo nui loa. I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> Gosh, that was, you know, someone told me once as wahine, we fear anger. We're, we're brought up to fear anger. And what we as women need to do is turn our anger from being a grenade to a sniper. Mm. And that, my friend, is using your words for a sniper. 
and I think you hit the mark. It's amazing. Yeah. So I was so busy being affected, I didn't take very good notes about what to ask you about <laughs> afterwards. Well, I, I do want to shout out my mentor. Um, he was a mentor to so many of us, Honani K. Trask, um, who recently passed, but she, of her many lessons taught us, not just Owivi Wahine, but Wahine throughout globally, never let anyone tell you not to be angry. And she was so fearless and unapologetic about the way she sharpened her anger toward analysis and transformation. There is no one like Honani. And, and her poetry, her poetry taught me that rage and rapture not only coexist, but they shape, they shape our bodies and what we do with it for our lahui, for our people in such important ways. So mahalo nui loa forever to Honani Ke. I'm also really pleased that you went just after Alyssa as well, because we all write from different places at different times in our lives. Now, I, I know for me, my first book came from a place of trauma, but my second book came from a place of anger. I'd be interested in whether this overarching sense of a wairua, as we'd call it in Māori, or, or, or sense of anger affects your other work equally, or whether this poem was a story that you felt that, that you're told in its entirety? Mm. What, I, what I love about us as the indigenous people of Oceania, we know and embrace how complex we are and history and settler colonization and militarization will write to the bone to try to convince everyone else that we are just one thing that we are prehistory, we are an ancient past. And our refusal of that is not just this, it's also this really intentional embrace of who we know to be. I refuse your simplification because I'm holding my kupuna tighter. I refuse your passivity because I'm holding my ancestors' strength tighter. So I think refusal and affirmation, just like rage and rapture, go hand in hand. And, you know, I'm Hawaiian. OEV non-binary brilliance is just something that makes me so proud every day. I am so proud of where I come from. And I was lucky to be raised by strong Hawaiian women who chin up you know, chin up, you know where you come from, be proud. And I, I, I wasn't raised otherwise. So I think there's a pattern forming. All my gratitude is for these beautiful, strong, fearless women. And I think, you know, that's why I write. My writing is an expression of gratitude. It's a practice of gratitude. You know, and building on that, one thing I'm absolutely loving about this is I feel like we're creating a space for these conversations as well. And I hope that we can continue. I hope that this is a beginning rather than an end in terms of having these conversations. Yeah, and I, I think you asked uh, Dr. Thayman about how it feels to critique. Um, mm. And, you know, I was thinking and I'm thinking about what we've been talking about so far. And, you know, a flashlight is not a critique of darkness. It's a tool that helps me move in darkness. And so I think the work Dr. Thayman has done, the work Hamani K has done, it's not, it's a tool. It's a tool for us to be able to move because so many people, whether we're women, whether we're queer, whether we're of different abilities will tell us not to move, to stay still. And our poetry as Dr. Thayman so wonderfully exemplifies, helps us to move. And I think of Teresa Tiaiwa's poems, you know, 
we're gonna move. We're gonna move because we're part of this ocean, right? I'm so proud. I'm so proud of all of us. <laughs> No, I'm absolutely delighted to hear you say that. That incredibly powerful. I so say thank you. And I think now we'll move on to our final poet, Jasmine, J Jasmine Navala Waliafia, joining us all the way from Honiara. And I'm absolutely delighted that you could make it. Um, just to introduce her briefly, she's been writing poems ever since high school. She participated during the 11th and 12th Festival of the Pacific Arts. She's a chairperson of the Melanesian Arts Festival Literary Subcommittee and an author of the self-published poetry collection, I Dream. She's published short stories and poems in Telemaut, stories of peace and conflicts in the Solomon Islands. She's also contributed stories to a prep school in sorry, to prep school material, a story a day, Pacifica works out, and she works out of Hangata Public Library in Kinalamitin G Pacificu. And apologies for some of my pronunciation there. Um, but if we could hear from you, one of your poems, that, that would be great. Thank you, Laura, and everybody else. I'm I'm so speechless listening to your wonderful words um, this afternoon and all the themes that were coming through uh, are connecting us all and um, you yourself being a Macronesian woman and the environment that we exist in. So this afternoon I'll be sharing with you um, something that we can all relate to and I'm sure it will amplify the themes that you have already shared on. Well, hello, aloha. I guess this is a very important opportunity for me to use the words. I've never been to Hawaii, was looking forward to it, but uh, 2020 didn't come through because the pandemic stole our, our opportunity to be in Hawaii. And hallelujah for everyone. Africa, Europe, Asia, and both South and North America are continents which are bound by a less piece of land. But the Pacific is bound by the Oceania. The Oceania that brushes our shores. And yes, we can all attest to the fact that our livelihoods and the coherence of our society connects to the ocean, whether it be Melanesia, Micronesia, or Polynesia, the Moana, or the Tasi, more, uh, the, the, the terminology that is more used in our Melanesian group of uh, dialect, indigenous dialect, holds the element that is spiritual to our daily existence, our culture. And the mystical um, perspectives of the ocean are passed down to ages and generations by our elderly. Um, to say the magnitude of the Oceania holds a lot of untold mysteries, right? And the poem that I'll be sharing with you this afternoon would I have two poems, but I will just share with you one. Um, and I might distribute uh, copies of the others to you later. Um, it's entitled The Waves. Myself and some fellow writers were seated beside um, a hotel boardwalk one afternoon and we were watching the ocean and we got the inspiration. And all of us were asked to write something about the waves. And so, that I'll be sharing with you this afternoon is entitled The Waves, and I'd like to dedicate this poem. My apologies, I'm really emotional this afternoon because I have my poet mentor here with me, and it's an honor to be with you here, Dr. Chairman. Since I was in, in high school, she is my model of poets in the Pacific, and we've been studying her poems. And, um, she's my lecturer also in one of the post-grad um, 
courses that I've done with the University of South Pacific. Um, and I'd like to dedicate this poem to her. It was entitled The Waves. The Waves. What do they say? And what do I hear? In the warm sprays, which we call laughing and thunderous breakfast. Is there a numerous tale to tell? Oh, how I wish. I but hear what they say. The waves. What do they feel? And how do I feel? From the tickers bubbling to moody white crests and deep blue beyond. Is there a color to their soul? Oh, how I wish I but feel what they feel. The waves. Where do they wander? And why do I wonder? The waves, they brush the wrecks, they busted. And the waters of the world beyond. Oh, how I wish I but know where they want it. Thank you. It's just beautiful. You know, and, and, and I think a poem about the waves, about the moana being that thing, you know, we may not have been to each other's countries, but we are separated by the same ocean. I'd be interested to know from you, actually, the same question that I asked Alyssa about your influences. It's something that I'd be really interested to hear a little more about. Yes. Um, I guess before I read the poem, I was telling you about this opportunity I had with some friends. We said um, there are and watch the ocean. And many times we, you know, because the ocean is part of our environment, it, most many of our traditions and our cultures, our perspectives are derived from the ocean. And many a times we take it for granted, you know, what's in our environment, um, like I have alluded to earlier. But the Oceania and the Pacific itself, we're all connected by the water. And basically, you know, many times I find myself lost. I feel that I'm just part of, of the environment that I exist in. And how I interact with my environment and the coherence I have with my environment determines who I am and you know, I can identify with it. So the ocean is one of those things I can, I, I can identify myself with and to, you know, take, uh, take the time to sit back and then you, you look at the magnitude of this aspect of the environment. There is so much mysteries in it. And if we are lucky enough to catch a glimpse of a perspective about the ocean, it also determines how, you know, the daily, um, our daily existence. What do we get from the ocean? That's our livelihood. That's where we get gather our food from. That's where we gather our, our custom stories from. Uh, the myths that uh, we share, you know, we pass on through generations. How do we, we, we explain our, our societal existence? You know, at least once in a while, we can, we can relate those matters to the environment. And one of the, one of the significant aspects of the environment that we as Oceanian people, we can relate to without hesitation is the ocean. And so I guess the ocean holds a very uh, significant um, worldview for us in the Pacific. And 
that would be a key influence uh, for myself and how I would view myself as a Pacific Island. Thank you. And it occurs to me as well, we're so well represented in this group about people from different parts of the Pacific. And for us to come together like this and for you to share that reminder of what the ocean is to all of us. We all feel it in our hearts, but to hear it with our ears, with such beautiful words, you know, is an absolute gift. And I thank you for that. I did just have one, one last question as well, which was, has the environment and the natural environment in relationship with our environment shaped your other work? I'm interested in whether this is a theme that carries through your other poetry. Yes, absolutely. Um, if I, I, I had the opportunity next time to, to share, um, much of my work are, are really connected to, to basically the geographical environment that um, you, you'll find everywhere in the islands uh, across the Pacific. And many a times, uh, much of my work, I'd like to ensure that I, I depict the flora, the fauna, and um, significance that um, these elements in the environment hold for the people within our community. So yes, um, I would say that there is nothing more, nothing less than that, that of, of, of the indigenous knowledge that we as Pacific Islanders should promote, whether it be the indigenous languages, whether it be the concept surrounding a particular traditional way of doing things that coherence with um, the, the local environment, so be it. Um, for example, um, I must say that many of us, um, we grew up with something that is significant to us whether it be uh, a geographical uh, aspect like the river or a mountain or the volcano, all our um, tales or the mysteries that we, we passed down to generations would be related to those uh, geographical things uh, in our environment. So yes, I guess we should give more credit. We should give more, more emphasis to those things that will be there. For example, the amount, a, a mountain in our local environment, the river in our local environment, the ocean, they will last. Us, from generation to generation, we will exist. But those things, they stay and are ageless. And the kind of information that we encompass around those significant um, things in our environment, the flora and the fauna, can be passed down to generations, probably by using poems like this. Uh, one day we will be gone, but our poems will hold this perspective, you know, in a written kind of uh, form so that the younger generations can learn about their culture, can learn about the well view of a certain generation into the future. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much. Now we've all heard from the individual poets. I just thought it would be great to take this opportunity for everybody to perhaps one at a time can share their views on carrying culture. You know, what does carrying culture mean to us? What do we hope to achieve? You know, what do we hope to see in the future? And do we feel any burdens as being Indigenous Wahine artists when it comes to carrying our culture based on the theme of this talk? And if anyone's got any particular insights, I wondered maybe starting with starting with Alyssa, if you've got any thoughts on that, I'd, I'd love to hear them. 
Thank you. Yes, I'd love to share. Um, I think for me, caring culture means retreating, means returning to what I know is good and true. And I think for me, that's my culture, land, people. Um, and I think it also means representing that. And I think that goes for, for indigenous people everywhere, knowing who you are, leaning into who you are and making sure that it's known, that you know who you are and the people around you see what you represent. Um, I think, again, I've, I've spoken briefly about struggles with identity and the trauma that came with that. And I think for a long time, I felt like I'm not tomorrow enough. I was told many times, you're not, you're not really tomorrow. And I think for, you know, diaspora community, that's just a wonderful thing. You just grow up having that sort of complex. Um, and I think it's taken a long time to work through it, but caring culture means being proud, not hiding, knowing the significance of your culture, of your being, of your core, um, of your gut and what that means. Um, I think in terms of achieving things and, and, and burdens, I'm really grateful and really blessed to be surrounded by Pacific Islanders. You know, PIDP is a wonderful place to work. I have Chimel representation that I never had growing up. Um, we have people at PIDP from Fiji, from Tonga, diaspora community, you know, just this wide range of people. And I think I'm learning what those burdens are for my community, for my people. Um, and yeah, in terms of achieving things, I think personally, I think about family. I think about, I think very, very far in the future about my children, about their children and their children. And I think it starts with conversations and safe spaces like this one that we're in today. Um, and sort of having, being able to find that solace in, in other indigenous communities and other indigenous artists and women and, and poets. Um, and I think this is the kind of space that, that, that needs to be cultivated. Um, and yeah, drawing close to one another, just making sure people are connected and, and people recognize who they are and the part they play in their community and in those safe spaces. Yeah. Absolutely. Everything you've said certainly resonates with me. I'd be interested, no, if you've got anything to build on that. I think coming right off of what Alyssa just said, whatever we achieve, we have to achieve it together. It's a kako thing. And when I say together, I mean with our lands and with our waters liberated and under the kind of stewardship that our ancestors understood. So, and we know this and we know this so in our blood that when we say we, we say, we mean our aina, we mean our waters, we mean our sky, we mean the creatures who are part of of us and I think I think indigenous folk, especially women in Oceania, are often expected to perform a certain script of authenticity, you know, and I think people bring to port idealized versions of who your people are and how your you are or you are not authentic. And that's coming from, you know, what Alyssa is saying. And that kind of, that, that energy brain inevitably will lead to erasure. But we are not your relics. We are not your vessels to paradise. We are not your vessels to ancient history. Our cultures are alive and growing as Dr. Thayman so said. They are, they are spiraling, they are rooting, they are reaching. And Oceania, to go back to Albert Wendt, deserves more than mundane fact and that's where poets come in <laughs> that's where poets come in and whatever we achieve we must achieve together
And this idea of identity and who we are, you know, I guess it's such a personal journey. But one thing I've really taken from this is a reminder that it is an incredibly personal journey, self-identity, but it is also a collective journey. You know, we're constantly bombarded with stereotypes, with ideas of who we ought to be, which is often based on assumptions, misunderstandings, or the rawest of, you know, pe people projecting certain things on a culture. And I think we are who we are. And we've got to also recognize that if we feel that we don't completely fit in a culture, there's probably a reason for that that's not our fault, you know. That's particularly personal for me as well because, you know, I always felt very uncomfortable being a Māori person with no marae, with no meeting house. And I felt for many years that that meant I didn't count until it was pointed out to me by one of my family members that we don't have it because it was taken from us, you know. So in a way, if we have these internal issues about our own identity we're giving too much to the people that took our identity from us in the first place so it's just about standing tall standing strong and you know we, we, none of us are the same we can be who we are without having to bend and shape ourselves why is cultural identity any different yeah like we don't consent to no. our own erasure I no. don't consent. No. You know? Yeah. No. And if someone tells me I'm too white presenting to be Māori, which, by the way, Māori never say. It's only ever white people because I don't adhere to their stereotypes. Then too bad. <laughs> they can do them and I'll do me. Thank you. And lastly, I'd love to hear what Jasmine has to say about this issue of carrying culture. I guess Alicia and Noel have well covered and have bring home the message that perhaps I would like to share as well. But yes, stewardship paramount to you. We are stewards of the culture that were passed down to us over generation. And we are here today. This is today. We have a generation that is waiting out there and who is going to run it who is responsible for ensuring that what has been passed on to our generation leaves on leaves on in the next generation that will be existing on the oceania within the oceania who will be responsible for embracing that promoting it, advocating for it. And that's a very good reminder now that we are stewards. The responsibility is on our shoulders. And it comes down to the fact that if we ourselves in this present generation do not embrace it, do not see the importance of our indigenous knowledge of the Pacific, and we do not put it in the right place, we do not give it the right recognition, then we will lose it. We will lose it. But the honors is now on us, this generation of women, basically all women here now, and also male poetries, poetries out there, to ensure that we shoulder the responsibility of ensuring that the Oceania culture, the Pacific culture, lives on into the next generation that are there to come. Thank you. That was oh, that was amazing. This conversation's got me all buzzing. I believe the phrase is chicken skin that you use in Hawaii, one phrase that I've learned from living here. But th thank you, that's amazing. I think now, I guess just to wrap up from this amazing time that we've just had in this conversation, which I, I don't know about you, but I found incredibly enlightening. I do have a few, I guess, themes to draw together, but I just wondered before I did that, I just wanted to ask if anyone else had anything that they wanted to add. 
I just had one one thing to to add because um, I've been listening and just loving listening to all the others about caring culture and and for me um, I carry my culture for mainly because it's a, it gives me security and it gives me identity and I carry it proudly and it's as I um, heard earlier from um, from colleagues it's my responsibility to carry this to pass this on to future generations through my words um, and through my actions and uh, and I think it's a, a beautiful theme carrying culture and sometimes we get tired <laughs> it's a very big load but we we soldier on knowing that what we do may be of some use to the future generation so thank you for you all um, for your contribution it makes my lighter my my load a lot lighter <laughs> thank you we carry it together we carry it together <laughs> yeah right sharing <laughs> And thank you for being such a such a guide to us, Dr. Salman. Unfortunately, my own IT issues have got me zooming on a on a phone, which means I don't have the full screen of people, unfortunately. Um, but it's motivation to fix my laptop, so I'll be a little bit better next time. But thank you. I'm absolutely honoured to hear all these words from all of <laughs> you. You know, and I suppose in in terms of closing remarks from me. This has been really cool. It's been really amazing. You know, I, I used that Māori whakatoki at the beginning about how a read by itself is weak, but together we're strong. And I think that it is something that we that we that we are we are strong when we're together. And even though we're from different parts of the world and have walked different lives, there's still a lot that still have we have in common. There's a lot we have in common. And let's amplify, <laughs> our, amplify our voices. And I think for me, the key theme here is the power of our words. You know, poetry may feel sparse and it may be hard to write, but it's really strong, isn't it? And every single one of those poems has evoked something in me that's told a story that is bigger than the poet. It's bigger than the culture. It's, it's bigger than all of us in a way, but it's something that we are all part of. And I think that's really, really special. So thank you very much for having me tonight. And I'm absolutely delighted. And, and I really look forward to seeing the formal recording of this. So I can write down all the quotes that I've heard from all you wise wahine and carry them with me into the future. Thank you. <laughs>